the plan was to break down what are mutual funds, how do they work, and all the nitty gritty details in between. Yeah, so we had a moment where uh, we were trying to figure out how might we provide some value to our listeners. And so today, um, we're gonna go through a little bit of a like back the truck up version, get back to some of the basics for investors. Uh, there's some real good reasons for this. One, part of it is, I'm gonna remind everybody out there, right? We're now officially into April, it's April 2nd. We're at the T minus two weeks and dropping to get your taxes lined up or you know to a lot, arrange for an extension. But you've also got some critical deadlines to get uh, IRAs funded for last year, mm -hmm. right? So it's not too late to invest in an IRA or possibly Roth IRA for tax year 2023. Yeah, but okay. we're running really, really short on time. Right. Now, here's why this is relevant. For some of you out there, you're going, hey, this is like, I haven't been investing before. I'm getting started. So maybe you're listening and you're, you're not coming to an advisor at this point. You're just going to do some things on your own because it kind of makes sense and because Financial advisors, like a lot of things, right? There's a point at which it's expensive to have an advisor. And then there's a point at which it's worth it anyway, right? The mm -hmm. cost becomes worth it, right? And, yeah. and there's that threshold, like when, when should you do something yourself versus when you should use transition? I'm not talking about what that threshold is. Let's just say you're still in DIY camp, mm -hmm. right? Then you may be starting an IRA from zero. How are you likely to do that? probably mutual funds. Sure. Right. You probably are going to buy mutual funds. There are some ways that you can buy stocks now, right? There you are can do fractional trades with Correct. some platforms. And so, you know, a diversified ETF that has a low cost to it. You right. Might be or able to buy you can fractional. buy, there are some areas like, I, I'm not certain because I don't know all the details about it. Right. But like, I think Schwab has a, a DIY investor account and they have a program called slice where you can buy fractions of a stock. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so then you could kind of pick your own stocks like Robinhood does this. Right. Right. Oh, I want to buy a share of Apple and Apple's a, like $180 a share or something. And you have a hundred dollars in your account. Well, you could, you don't have, you don't have enough to buy a whole share of Apple, but you can buy $25 worth of Apple. You don't own a whole share. You don't get to vote on the share because you don't own it, but you do own some the representative it. equity, right? Yeah. So you still get the value of the movement. It's just a fraction of that share. And it's the custodian in this case is making that arrangement. But let's not get lost in the weeds of that. For a lot of people that are getting started, they're not interested in buying the individual stocks and getting really cute and clever. They're saying it's long-term investment. I'm doing this for tax savings. I'm going to go buy a mutual fund. So the first question is, why buy a mutual fund? Well, one of the perks, I guess, to it is it allows you to have ownership of a, well, I'm air quoting that, but you can buy into a fund that inside of that fund owns a lot of the stocks you might want to own, right? So say a mutual fund has Apple, like you just talked about. It might also have Microsoft in that fund, and it might have maybe four or 500 different companies. And even though you only bought one share of the mutual fund, you now are fractionally invested in all of those companies that the mutual fund holds. So it allows you to diversify, right? You can own a lot of different companies, but you're able to do it at a cost where you're, you're able to spread that money out. Yeah. Basically, instead of buying each stock on its own, mm -hmm. you're buying the basket that already has the stocks in it. Right. And so they're sort of prepackaged for you, right? Now, when somebody prepackages a basket for you, there are some costs associated with it, right? right? Because the, it was packaged. And sometimes okay? that fee can be really small or it can be really large. Yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those components today, but just foundationally, mm -hmm. what you need to know about a mutual fund is you're not directly buying the investments the fund owns, you're buying a package from an investment company. Yes. Okay. So the investment company takes your money and in exchange, they give you ownership in a certain number of shares or fractions of shares in the basket that they have. That's the mutual fund. Okay. And there's different types. We, it does, the purpose of this show is not to go into the types like, is it a unit investment trust or, you know, is it an is ETF it a, or what? I'm, are we even going to get into like a front loaded? We're not even going to get that far. We'll the talk week, are we? very high level about okay. that in costs. All right. Because right? we're going to talk about that, but we're not going to talk about that 
in this segment. We're gonna just talk about what what is the mutual fund built for? And it's built for people that wanna get started or even if you have more money, but you don't want the responsibility of it managing the stocks, you're paying a company to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And because they are Because there's a fund that. manager. Yes. Right. Well, typically yes. The fund manager might be a computer. Sure. Okay? Because if you're gonna buy an index fund, then that's a passive strategy, right? There are some mutual funds that it's just a programmed strategy. There's not a person steering the ship. There's just a computer following the recipe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, by the way. Some of these recipes are really good, right? Right. Grandma's cookies are fine the way they are. Don't mess with it. Okay. The S&P 500 is a pretty good formula for a long-term investment success. Very difficult to outperform that over time because that recipe favors the things that are winning and discards the things that are not mm -hmm. automatically. So it's a pretty good way to make money. It's just not without volatility and risk because it's heavily leveraged to equities. It's heavily growth oriented. So you're going to get a lot of volatility in the S&P 500 sort of by definition, mm -hmm. okay? Because that's the pool that you're playing in. Here's the interesting thing about mutual funds. They come in all different shapes, sizes, and flavors, right? Right? Because they don't... Because it's a company buying investments and pooling those investments together with, with a group of investors, right? They're, they're taking a bunch of investors, pooling the money, and buying investments with them. They can buy different types of investments or different strategies. Mm -hmm. So you might get a fund that's really specialized, right? Maybe it's only buying tech, tech funds that specialize in making semiconductors. Mm-hmm. Okay? Or you might get a general fund that's trying to be an entire investment strategy in one single purchase. So it's buying stocks and bonds and real estate and it's balancing risk and it's adjusting over time and it's doing a whole bunch of stuff for you automatically or any flavor in between. Mm. And they're out there. There's thousands of mutual funds. Do you, should we talk today a little bit about what a target date fund is? Because a lot of people own target date funds and they really don't know what they are. Why don't you give just a high level? I wasn't going to go deep into it, but I did just yeah. kind of describe that. Yeah, Can you kind of did. Yeah. yeah, help our listeners understand that target date so fund concept. A target date fund is, is a mutual fund that's looking at um, kind of your age and when it is that you might retire. And so if you are, say, you know, planning to retire in 2065, there's a target date fund out there that is targeting that date for you and it's going to adjust the your exposure to stocks versus bonds. Um, as you age, you're gonna be less in stocks and more in bonds. That's a really simple way of putting it. Yeah, it's but, gonna shift from more aggressive to more conservative as you approach retirement. Yep, so every year the fund manager is probably gonna go in there and um, adjust the weightings based on, on your, your as you get closer to that date. Right. And the reason it's important to know this is target dates are becoming, th these target date funds are becoming really, really common yes. in employer sponsored retirement plans. They like are. 401k plans. We're talking a little bit about mutual funds today. Okay. Sure. Some of the things investors ought to look at, right? Sure. If you're not buying, or even if you're buying a pre-built fund, like a target date fund, what are some things that people should look at when evaluating a mutual fund? I mean, one of the things you could look at would be past performance. I mean, how has this fund done over the last, you know, three years, five years, or 10 years? Um, so that's one thing you could look at. You could also look at um, like the expense ratio. So what are you paying to be in that fund compared to maybe another mutual fund that has a very similar objective? Um, if one of them is at 1% and the other one is at 0.01% and they're investing in the same thing, it might not make sense to choose the one with the higher fee. Yeah. So let's break that down for a second for everybody out there. Because maybe you're not a financial pro and you're looking at this going, all right, you just said stuff and I'm not sure what that means. First, I'm going to tell you, past performance never guarantees the future, right? No. Not, and so what you can look for in past performance is has the manager been consistent in different market environments? If they say they're investing in large value companies, do they continue to do so, right? Have they sort of stayed true to the prospectus? So that's a good thing to look at, but you're not, the past performance can give you a, there, there, are, there are some interesting studies suggest companies that, that um, have high expense ratios, 
mm-hmm. and and consistently fall in the bottom half of performers tend to persist there. They right. tend not to get better. So there's some studies that suggest that. Doesn't validate it, just suggest it, right? Mm-hmm. So what we look for first is expenses are relevant. Okay, they imagine are. if you had to walk around and you know drag an anchor with you all the time. Mm-hmm. High expenses are like that. If you have to carry around, a very, if your manager costs a lot, they have to perform well in order to overcome their ch- their costs. Exactly. Okay, so expenses absolutely are relevant, but they're not the total story, no. interestingly enough, because mutual funds report their investment performance net of fees. Mm-hmm. So we care because it's an indicator, but it, it the result is what really matters. Right. Okay. Here's another one that people don't necessarily look at. There's something called a turnover ratio. Ooh, that's a big piece. Okay. What do you think that means? It's looking at how long the person that's in charge of that fund has been in charge of it, right? Like if the fund, no. No, sorry. I'm going to, you're talking about manager tenure. Right. This is just swapping a term here. So the manager tenure, definitely. Turnover ratio inside of the fund is actually how frequently the investments are bought and sold. Oh, right? so are they constantly trading in it? Yeah, churning. Okay. Think about it, right? Now, the the fund may not actually, they're not making commissions by churning. Churning is a, kind of a dirty word in investing, right? Mm-hmm. That was the idea when a stockbroker used to buy and sell things to, to profit themselves, but not the customer. So churning was, a, it was not legal, right? You're just right. turning the account over to make money for the, the brokerage firm instead of the customer. So a mutual fund swapping in and out of funds or or in and out of the investments inside of it isn't churning like that, but it does mean it's less likely to be tax efficient, right? There's lots of buys and sells. And so higher turnover tends to include higher expenses and lower tax efficiency. Just because of the volume of the trades. Yeah, because it's frequently changing the investment. Now some strategies have to have high turnover. Yeah. Right. I mean, maybe you're in a, a, like an option strategy or something where options expire every 30 to 90 days. Right. So they need to expect it. Yeah. But the turnover ratio and sort of the, the, the metric is does more than 100 percent of the portfolio turnover. So if you have a, mm-hmm. more than 100 percent, you expect that there's the stocks basically are held less than a year. So you can count on having capital gains distributions during the year. And yeah. we, we're not going to go into deep explanation there. Just know that it's part of how efficient a fund is. And you, your taxes are higher if you get short-term capital gains distributions. Mm-hmm. So that is a, that's a consideration. So now talk to me about that manager tenure, though. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the turnover mean, of managers is right. separate, right? And I know that's what you're kind of yeah. angling towards. Yeah, so what yeah. do you mean? What well, do you mean? I mean, you, you want to look and see how long has someone been in charge of the fund? Because, I mean, even though we talked about this before, past performance might not be a great indicator of the future. If you are looking at past performance and you're saying, wow, this fund has crushed it over the last 10 years, but six months ago, the person who ran it for 10 years is gone and someone new is in charge of maybe managing that fund or orchestrating how things are bought and sold, you don't want to go buy the fund hoping for similar performance if that person isn't there. Or maybe you do, but that's something that you need to look at and just at least be yeah. aware of. Well, so let me give you just a couple of other metrics that are really relevant to the manager themselves. Mm-hmm. If there's a manager, right? If there's no manager, then it's just whether or not the strategy does this thing right. Okay. One of them is alpha. Okay. Okay. One of our favorites, right? Alpha, it, it, let's think of it, it's, it's a statistical measurement, but it's oftentimes reported as just alpha. So like if you go to a lot of the free uh, research sites, so whether you go to Yahoo or you go to Google or you go to uh, like Morningstar is a really common mm-hmm. one. I know it's a long name, but right, Morningstar is a, a research firm. They, they will report how these different investments perform and, and they will track something called alpha. It's a measure of how much outperformance a manager is generating. That's a right? really good way to look at that and try and gauge it yeah. as an actual number. So you want a positive alpha. That means that the manager is actually adding benefit for mm-hmm. their decision making. If you have a low to non-existent or even negative alpha, then the manager is not helping the performance. Right. So then if they're trying to sell you on the idea this manager is really great, but the alpha is negative, you go, well, one or two years here or there might be an anomaly, but if they're consistently not generating alpha, then 
that's a problem. Another metric you're going to see that you should know is beta. Right. Okay. Beta is just a volatility measurement. That's mm -hmm. like how much does the that investment whipsaw around relative to a benchmark. Sure. Typically, it's the S&P 500, but it might not be depending on what they're benchmarking the fund against. Mm -hmm. Okay. So alpha and beta are two biggies. There's another one called the sharp ratio. Yeah. Okay. You just want a positive sharp ratio. Okay. Yep. So that, that's, again, an indication that you're getting um, positive returns for the asset class. For the, vol for the volatility underlying the asset. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're going to have a high beta, you better have a high sharp ratio too, right? Yeah. You want to see return in comparison to how much, you know, volatility is. Yeah. You don't want to go get in the boat, have it rock like crazy and go nowhere. Yes, okay, that's, exactly. that's a that's a terrible thing to have happen. If the boat's going to rock a lot, it better be headed somewhere. Right? Yes, so that's exactly. the sharp ratio concept. So those are just a few. The term is R squared. And if you're wondering, why do I care about R squared? It's one of the most common mistakes that investors make in mutual funds. And this one can help you sniff it out. This is a common mistake. It's an accident, right? But when I say common, it can happen because it sort of sneaks up on you. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the frog in the water thing where the water just gets warmer. And then you realize, like, huh, look at that. So imagine that you uh, you see a mutual fund and it's doing well. You buy into it and it keeps doing well. And other people take notice and they start throwing money at the manager because okay. they want to participate in this good performance. Then the manager has to go figure out where to put the new money. Correct. That money, because there's a prospectus, says I got to keep doing this. And that manager has to start buying more stuff. And at first, they just got to buy their very best ideas. Mm -hmm. But now they've run out of the ability to keep buying those because at some point, mutual funds can't become more than a majority shareholder. I think so it's they, what, so 10%, 10 percent is yeah. typically the limit of ownership in a company. Right. right? The, the mutual fund can't own and more than X. It can actually be easier than you think. A lot of people are probably like, well, there's no way you could own 10% of a company. But if you're a... If it's a smaller company, you can. The Small key. caps yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. Right? So companies got a billion dollars and they have to go buy small caps that are worth, you know, 500 million. It's like, well, you put $50 million in that thing and you're capped out. Yep. Right? And you've still got $950 billion you got to put to work somewhere. Yeah. So it can it go can happen, faster than right? you think. Yeah. So you, you start going to your plan B, they're still okay ideas, but not as good. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the issue is that um, funds, as they well, attract money, they get yeah. bigger. So a couple things can happen. One, they may close the fund. No more money. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, there are, there are funds that they did well. And in order to protect their existing investors, they had to shut off the 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 money from coming in. I said, if you're grandfathered in, you get to keep it if you already own it, but nobody else can come in. Right. That's one. The other is they just keep getting bigger. They may have to change the prospectus to accommodate for more. But what will happen sometimes is they will become what we'll call a phantom index. How do they do that? Kind of walk us through. You just keep having to buy more and you become more diversified as you do mm -hmm. until what happens is your performance starts as a manager to closer and closer it to a starts index. to mimic an index. This is where R squared is really important. It's mm. the statistical measure that says how much of the investment per return can be attributed to its underlying benchmark, right? And so it's really common with large growth funds to say, well, how much does that large growth fund look like the S&P 500? Right. So if I'm invested and I have a set of mutual funds that are kind of walking and talking. Yeah. Similar, and you start to see an R squared value above like 0 0.92, 0 0.93, 92, 93% of the fund's performance can be explained by the S&P 500's performance. So you're going, wait, you're going to pay an active manager a fee to get you a 7% differentiation between the index? Mm. That's pretty statistically small. That 7%, even if it, like, it would have to do extremely well. Because imagine 7% right. of the portfolio outperformed right. well, by 10%. I mean, we could run the numbers. If you have a million dollars invested, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what, what were the numbers you just used? You said 93%. Yeah, an R squared index. of 93, yeah, so 0. If, 0.93, right? If you're, it can only go to yeah. one. Yeah. So if only 7% of your money is differing from the index on a million dollars even, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not just that too, because you may only have like 100 stocks mm -hmm. and the index has 500 stocks. 
but the 100 stocks you have behave so much like the index that it's still basically 95, right. you know, 90 plus percent the same as the index from a performance perspective. So why not just buy the index and save the expense? Exactly. And that's the key here. And that's why uh, we tend to, with really big funds, right, really like mega caps, we want to look at our squared value and it can sneak in there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's also something that's not, uh, I don't think a lot of people are trained to look for. And it's not the end all be all. Right. I mean, it's just another statistic. Uh, it's just that maybe you don't need to pay that expense. You can keep that money invested and working for you rather than going into the managerial cost of the fund. So if you have a mutual fund, sometimes it's tricky because you may have a mutual fund in a 401k and the ticker symbol isn't the ticker symbol you're used to. It's a long string of numbers. You might have to look at the name of that fund mm -hmm. and then go look it up by name and then look at the different share classes of that fund. Because this is the other thing, right? You, there's, you can have one mutual fund and it's really weird. Imagine like if, if we did this with, we'll just pick a car company. Let's say that we, we would, uh, the only one that's coming to mind is like a Toyota Camry, right? Like a Camry is a Camry, okay? But what if you bought the same Camry, except one of them gets 50 miles to the gallon, one of them gets 30 miles to the gallon, and one gets 10 miles to the gallon. Hmm. The same car. And you're gonna go, huh? Hmm. It's like, well, one of them, some of the gas gets siphoned off and given to somebody else. <laughs> that's kind of how mutual funds work. You have the same mutual fund, but the share classification, like you have an right. A share mutual fund or a B share or C share or L share or M share, all these different types, they're different expense structures. Right. So you go and look for what has a similar expense structure to your fund and then go look at the R squared and see if that is, mm -hmm. if you can get something else that has similar performance with a lower fee.